Okay, well, I think actually we might start um, by welcoming everyone to the, uh, the latest episode in our uh, summer series of complimentary workshops and webinars supported by Screen Skills Ireland. So, let me start now by introducing our esteemed panel. Uh, in no particular order, we have uh, Alison Crosby, you may know her from Spotlight. She began a career as a director's PA in the Irish film industry moving to London to become a casting associate and then coming back to Ireland as a casting director on a wide range of projects. Since January 2014, Ali's worked mainly at Spotlight as a membership engagement consultant, hosting career advice sessions, camera clinics, attending, attending industry events and festivals with Spotlight. Her casting credits include Connected TV, RTE2, Animo, Kite TV, Black Ice, Still and Bandit Films, Worked on Stitches with Fantastic Films and Philomena, Lost Child Films, and her PA credits include In the Name of the Father, Widow's Peak, and A Brief Sojourn into Clubland. At the Kitchen and Mr. Pussy's Cafe Deluxe, Dublin. How I miss that place. That was such a great place. I sound like I'm improvising now like Donald Trump. Let's stick to the script, Jimmy. Alison also holds an MA in Screenwriting from National Film School, IADT. Uh, and has recently begun working as a script editor as well. Patrick is founder and managing director of Wildcard, uh, Ireland's leading film distributor, working across theatrical, DVD, video on demand, and TV in Ireland and the UK. Uh, Wildcard projects include The Young Offenders, Bobby Sands, 66 Days, Cardboard Gangsters, Black 47, and The Hole in the Ground. Wildcard also manages Irish campaigns for major UK distribu distributors. Um, including uh, Oscar winners, Amy and Moonlight. Patrick's executive producer credits include The Hole in the Ground, Black 47, Ex uh, Extraordinary and Katie. He holds board positions with the Irish Film Institute, the Cork Film Festival, and is a member of the RAP Fund Investment Committee. Patrick's over 20 years experience in the film industry across, across a variety of roles, including seven years as an executive for Screen Ireland, and positions in international sales and film productions. His qualification, qualifications excuse me, include an MA in audiovisual management, uh, MSc in cyber psychology. I feel, I feel really under threat now for some reason. And, uh, and a BA in business studies. Thank you, Shin. Yeah, and <laughs> the uh, Tara Brady, referring to herself in the third person like Snoop Dogg. Yeah. Love that. Is a writer, not just a writer. She's a film critic for the Irish Times and a contributing editor at Look Left magazine and a regular guest on RTE's Arena. Um, she also has a brown belt in Krav Maga. Sounds violent, whatever it is. It is uh, violent. It is violent. Um, she also wrote a, plow, uh, a play that the Fringe were very excited about, but then, of course, the world tilted. I presume that means COVID. Um, so if ever, if ever our students get back in the room, we might do a, a table read or a dry run a test of that. Um, uh, and that Tara is, of course, always also president of the Dublin Films Critic Circle. Um, and I, I'd say you probably know her as well from her writing, uh, recognised. And I don't know, are you still writing with Hot Press? Do you still do stuff with them? Oh, no, 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 no. That's no. where I remember. That's where I remember you from, though, originally was working with yeah, Hot Press. Indeed. Okay. That's a long time ago. I wouldn't like to tell you how long ago that was. Okay. Well, that. We'll move swiftly along then, now that we've covered. And I am, obviously, uh, Shimmy Marcus uh, from Bow Street. And that's plenty about me. I know. Oh, no, let, let's have the full bio, Shimmy. Come I don't on. Have <laughs> let me start. Let me start by doing a kind of a general uh, question for each of you. Um, I want to talk, uh, or rather, ask you about. Tell us a little bit about uh, the work that you do within the industry, but also in relation to how uh, it intersects, either directly or indirectly, with with our actors and our acting community. Um, I don't know, uh, Patrick. Do you want to go first there? Sure. Um, so just give people a bit of a background. Um, Wildcard's a film distribution company. So what that means is we would acquire films um, more regularly now at an earlier stage, you know, so when films are kind of going in, into production. So we would acquire rights in those films um, and then kind of distribute them. So put the films out into cinemas, DVD less so now, to be honest. Uh, 
you know, we would get it up onto iTunes, we would do deals with the likes of Amazon or, or Netflix and then sell it to RT. Now, you know, within that then there's, uh, you know, a fair amount of work in terms of, if you imagine booking cinemas, designing posters, creating trailers, you know, all the kind of marketing spend that might go along with that. And then, um, you know, what's probably relevant for the people watching is we would manage the publicity on that as well. And we would have a, a publicist we work with all the time called Glenn Hogarty and he would kind of lay as closely with cast in terms of you know managing you know that process when it comes to a film being released so you know if you have cast as you know you try place interviews and in kind of relevant and, and suitable uh, outlets. And in, in relation to you know um, having the actors helping to, to promote the film and talk about that and we'll get into a little more detail about that with Tara but you wouldn't have any direct input with the actors per se, is it more through the producer? You would ask them about, will, will you make your leads available for interview or how does that yeah, work? Yeah, like we would kind of, usually a joint approach, you know, in terms of if it's an Irish film, you know, a lot of times there's kind of direct connections there with kind of directors and, and the producers, you know, so they'd loop you in and, you know, you would make a point to always copy the kind of the local agent and um, yeah, so it's kind of on, on that level, yeah, and, and then if we're dealing with international films, you know, you mentioned the bio that we work on some international titles. So, you know, if, if there's a bigger international film or it's international cast, that's, you know, can often entail a lot of people on an email uh, between managers and, and agents and publicists. And, you know, that can be sometimes a bit more tricky. But, um, but yeah, it's a large part of what we do would be to focus to try and kind of get the most out of that. You know, we would kind of have a catch-all term of, you know, talent, but that, you know, the primary people in that are the cast. You know, we would also talk about the director and writer, um, you know, and producers. But um, yeah, the cast would be the main driving factor. And you know, when we are looking at acquiring films, that is a big thing that we look at. You know, and um, you know, and some casts, you know, are known for maybe, you know, being good with media and good with media commitments, and you know, have strong socials and willing to support. So you know. Um, I will say, you know, they may not be the driving force with an acquisition or us wanting to do a film, but it can often have a big part to play. And we're also involved in, in production. So, you know, again, you know, those things would be in the mix. I wouldn't say there would be a driving factor to whether, you know, the producer or director decides to kind of, you know, hire someone for a job. But, you know, we do have the relationship with kind of some production companies that, you know, would often run cast past us and say, Oh, what do you think about this guy? Or what do you think about this? You know, you know, what's the record like? You know, will you kind of run the numbers in their previous projects or, you know, have a look at their socials and activities and, you know, things like that. So, you know, it, it is a large, it, it's part of it. Yeah, for sure. And would that be during the casting process, Patrick? They would consult with you? It can be. Yeah. As I said, like, you know, I always like to say, you know, when we're talking to people that you don't necessarily want it to be, you know, that expression, the tail that wags the dog, you know, it's always like, get the right person for the role or the right person for the film, but there's no harm in having all the information to hand, you know, if stuff gets close, you know, and um, yeah, that can happen sometimes at an earlier stage. If I turn to you, Tara, I guess, uh, in terms of what, uh, how you work, um, the idea of skeletons in the closet and that kind of thing <laughs> as well. But, so in terms of uh, what it is that you do in terms of, well, in general as such, and then how it interacts with actors. Okay, well, the, the, the process is this. So, so I write film reviews, but film reviews don't pay very much, and they certainly don't pay enough to pay bills. So the most of our income, um, myself and Donald in the newspaper, comes from feature writing. And the vast majority of features are interview-based, and the vast majority of interview-based features happen at junkets, usually in London. Um, very, more often than not in London, um, up until recently when they all suddenly reverted to Zoom. Um, so so what, will, what will happen is Universal or Disney, um, to, to name one of the kind of big companies, um, will have talent and they'll fly them over to London from Los Angeles or wherever it is they're coming from. Well, more likely Toronto nowadays. You're nearly always shooting something in Toronto, which is standing in for Los Angeles. But they, um, and they'll fly them in and they'll, they'll do a day of press and, you 
you know, we'll, we'll get our precious 20 minutes with Robert Pattinson or whoever it is. And you sit down and, and you make the best of it because there will nearly always be no personal questions, no this, no that. Um, and, and more and more then you're really caught between a rock and a hard place because if it's, if it's a Marvel movie or something that's so paranoid about spoilers, it's like no personal questions and no questions about the film. And you're like, hmm what am I going to say for the next 20 minutes? But you know, you, you have, you have to work around certain conditions and they're, they're, they're quite well protected at that level. Um, certainly. Um, th- you know, there's also like things, you know, bits of paper that you'll have to sign, but it, and, there, and there, very often there's someone in the room as well, who's ready to jump in. Um, so that if you do say something uh, inappropriate and they can interpret anything as being inappropriate and they, they, they'll be there to, you know, put a like vaudeville hook and pull you out of the, out of the room in, in, in double quick time. And when, when things happen, like if I was doing some with Pat, I would be talking to the, to the wonderful Glenn Hogarty if I was doing something um, for, uh, for Wildcard and um, Glenn handles n- numerous accounts, um, including Entertainment One and, um, and Wildcard, of course, and, um he like he's a great person to work with but like there, there are lots of people like that there who might be independent pr people who will be rapping for a particular title or for a particular company is and you get this it's far more splintered obviously when you're looking at titles that are coming straight from london that mightn't be coming through um any like direct distributor here so it, it it that that becomes that's where it gets very diverse and i i don't know how many pr people i would work with in london altogether there'd be there'd be a lot of them Right. The higher up to the A-list or scale you go, the more difficult it is, the more uh, managed it is, the mm-hmm. more PC. It's almost like all these footballers who give the exact same trained answers to every question, the exact same. Um, we're not quite there yet with our upcoming Irish actors, are we? Or do you find that they are becoming very savvy or smart about how they, how they handle themselves in interviews now? Um, it's... It very much depends. I was just going back to something I was saying to Ali um, before we were saying, like, if you land a job with Netflix, for example, they're incredibly protective of their young actors. And they're incredibly protective of ev- on every level, be it s- it's intimacy on, on set, all those kind of things. Uh, and they're very, they're, they, they very much micromanage their careers. Um, the odds are, and you'll see this repeated um, across the board with Netflix, if, if a young actor lands one thing in Netflix, they'll land three things in Netflix. They'll, they'll, they'll be in a film or, or they'll be in a series or they'll be in something else. If Netflix has a good experience with them, they'll find things for them to do. But, but in return, they're, they're almost managed in the way that the old studio stars were managed um, before the kind of contract system broke down, where, where if you're Bette Davis or you're... Um, uh, Joan Crawford, you're contracted to a particular studio and they tell you what movies they do that you're going to do. And it's, if another studio really wants you for a role and um, they will come in and they'll, you know, sort of try and swap you around for something. But if ultimately it, it falls to the studio to manage your career and that. So it, it, it does, it very much depends on the project, it depends on the, the pure person who's handling. It depends on, it depends on all of those things. There's just, there's so many variables in terms of the kind of access you're going to get. And um, I, the thing I find with most young actors is they, um, they haven't really thought about it um, before when, when at the point where they're first doing their interviews um, they don't have experience and they haven't, they're not nearly familiar enough with the actual form of how an interview looks. Um, and I think that's a really, really important thing. If, if you want to be in movies, if you want to be in television, you need to read the coverage that's given movies and television. And you need, and you need to look at how actors are presented on TV and you need, to, you need to look at the form and you need to think about that and you need to think about what you're going to say in those circumstances and what your story is going to be. And, and, you, that, and that's just it, acting and storytelling and you need to work on your story. That, that's the bottom line. Um, before I come to you, Ali, I just think I just want to bring Patrick back in on this particular point in relation to the idea that uh, I, I, don't, I suspect you don't coach them, Patrick, but there has to be some kind of understanding that of, you know. Yeah, there, there'd be when we're kind of, if we're doing a junket, you know, there's definitely kind of a couple of key points, you know, like when we can release a film you know, it flows through in terms of, we call it like, how, how are we going to position this film or who's the target demographic, things like that, you know? So if you're doing a comedy, you know, you want to kind of 
but people keep saying it's very funny, you know, and things like that. And, you know, and that the junket is fun. And, you know, when you talk about kind of coaching them or, you know, sometimes the best junkets are actually for the more inexperienced actors. Uh, I always remember the young offenders, uh, which, you know, that junket, there's a lot on the cutting room floor that I'm glad we'll never see the light of day. There was some highly inappropriate things said uh, during that junket, you know, but, it, you know, it was really natural and it was really fun. And um, yeah, like there was, you, you kind of asked the actors to kind of maybe reinforce some kind of key points, be it about the film or, or the or the director or, or something like that. But, you know, I think I was, I don't know if Tara agrees, but I always feel the best interviews are the more kind of natural ones, you know, and where people are a bit more kind of relaxed and kind of, you know, give something of themselves. Um, you know, I, I, I can't prefer, prefer it like that. And so we wouldn't really, it's not like we'd sit down with someone for an hour before and say, you have to do this, you have to do that. Yeah. You know, it is kind of, we like to see the act, the personality of the actors in, in the, in it, you know. But you can see, but there's certain kind of real, real pros and I mean like sort of big stars who are brilliant at tailoring their interviews like I've been I've seen Will Smith for example and he's doing a zany breakfast show before um, before I come into the room and he's and then he like he, he talks to his people and he goes okay Irish Times and he immediately switches persona how do you do ma'am and it's uh, there. Are, there are stars that are really really good at that um, and and it's it's almost it's 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 part of their it's part of their star wattage, if you like, and it's it's part of their 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 charisma. And um, like like if you ever watch Tom Cruise on a red carpet, he makes eye contact with everyone, he shakes hands with everyone, and there and there is a certain kind of a lister that's very very good at that. They can they can tailor exactly um what they're doing, um and it, and it's very polished, you know. But it, but it it comes with practice and it comes with thinking about things um beforehand and preparing really well. Yeah, no, kind of like they know their audience, they know who they're speaking to. Yeah, exactly. Um, Ali, can you talk a little bit about, um, it's kind of broad, but what, what your role is within Spotlight and to what extent in your advice career sessions you might uh, talk about the idea of, of how you present yourself to the media? Yeah, and thanks, uh, Tara and Patrick. I thought that was uh, really informative. It's sort of making me think much more widely about the whole sort of constant, I suppose, duality for a lot of performers when, when you know, they're trying to sort of, I suppose, there's all these different sessions, there's all these different stages of trying to be in a room and deliver the performance and then sell yourself professionally to the, to the team that are around the production and keep that sort of line of professionalism but these people you know want want you to be on board of this fast moving short film uh, production that would be maybe 12 weeks 18 weeks and they want to work with you so i think that's the first thing that i think where all of this comes back to it's that sort of duality for a lot of performers about the performance and then their own persona you know it's kind of funny and how that works in the room and I think I think you can you can always you can always sort of understand people who get in the room and they just they're able to hit the mark and then keep it light and fluffy and get out of there like they understand there's a lot of different aspects and that would be something that we would always talk about when we're in studio when we're working with the with actors it's like you know you're sort of having you you know you're having all these different stages that you have to achieve to even get cast that's before you even get on a set you know it can be a bit of a you know a, a, a minefield for a lot of young performers starting out you know to to navigate all of those politics because it's such a funny profession because it's it's so intimate and it's so personal and it and it pulls so much on their on their own selves and like almost on their souls to deliver a good performance and then it's so complex navigating every time you do a film it's a different company it's a different director it's a different set you know team you know and I think it, it, it kind of reaches then into that whole press and distribution and kind of going on the whistle stop tour to sell it all. So I find this kind of very fascinating. And yeah, and I think, uh, you know, I think, I think a lot of people have very different approaches. Some actors just, you know, they really want to keep their nose clean and they almost go off grid 
you know, they don't have a profile. And then some people have it and they kind of use it as a support mechanism. You know, it, it, it's just, it's, it's so complicated and how that can backfire on you or how it can help you. I think, I think even with the digital platforms, they're all so novel really as for us, like 10 years old. I mean, people are kind of feeling their way along and, you know, it can be really upsetting for people when it blows up in their face. So it's a very delicate thing. It's, it's, it's absolutely, it's very hard, I think, for actors to navigate partly because, you know, they're trained to be an actor. Their passion is for, yes. you know, pursuing the truth within the performance. And now they have to go out and potentially put a smile on and sell a film that they have been half cut out of uh, or they didn't. Even, they don't even like as much as they thought it was going to be. They could have fallen out with their co-star and the director, and they've got to put their, you know, the brave face on and go, "It was great." Yeah. Any funny stories from set? No, we all loved each other. You know. If, um, I, I will say that if there is scenarios like that, like we never would like to think that we're putting pressure on someone to do something they they don't want to do, and you know we've a fair amount of films that we've released where you know there wouldn't be much kind of publicity just through availability or someone didn't feel comfortable doing it. So, you know, um, I, from our perspective, I wouldn't like to think that we would kind of, you know, cause we wouldn't like that to come through then in the interview, you know, where people are yeah. reading between the lines and, you know, can tell there's a bigger story there or, you know, um, cause the last thing you want going into a film release is to have this kind of, you know, yeah. the sense that something wasn't quite right, you know? Tara, you're nodding and laughing there as well. Uh, no, no, I can, I, I, can, I can think of titles that fit that bill. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe even one or two of yours. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I have to keep my mouth shut. Yes, yes, we'll practice, we'll practice our own uh, cautionary tales for, for the webinar. So, Ali, um, Ali you, is this something you think that uh, an actor can be taught? Is this a skill? Is it, you know, you see these car communications, how to present yourself, on, all that kind of stuff. Because it's not quite the same as, as investing in a character if you're presenting yourself. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's this really big thing, isn't it? It's like, you know, even within the, the tropes and the genre of performance and acting, you know, you have, you have stage, theatre, you know, there's so many levels. And um, it's like there's so many different uh, categories. Um, and, you know, big banging charisma in a theater it just fills the house you know and then it you've got to reverse that entire craft and skill for the camera like you know and turn it around and i think i think having that understanding of you know being a darling of understanding who in the room is the person you know like and particularly i think for a lot of young kind of performers trying to get purchase into the business it's like figuring out who are the players you know I'm sure if you worked in a hierarchical company you would know who the director and the chairman and the people you know who they are and you make it your business to understand that system and get introduced and I think a lot of it is about charisma but it's also about savvy and it's about hustle and it's about balancing all of that and you know, it's it's kind of funny, isn't it? I mean, I always think about these really big, wild Irish forefathers, like, you know, Bean and all of these kind of characters. And everybody said, like, the charisma would knock you out. Yeah. You know, but, you know, you kind of you wonder about how that translates onto platforms like social media for young performers now. You know, yeah. do you put up loads of you out partying, networking? No. Yeah, it's like, yeah. quite contradictory, isn't it? Well, that brings me, that's a perfect setup to go into uh, back to Patrick for a moment. And I know uh, this is very much part of your research, Tara, as well. Uh, but Patrick, you mentioned that, you know, you might talk to producers about uh, actors and what kind of profile they had. And it's something I see coming up an awful lot uh, on chat rooms between actors saying, would I have more chance of getting cast if I had a million Twitter followers versus someone who was, you know, only has 50? And do, do directors and producers take that into account as such? Um, do you think there's more pressure on actors to have that kind of social media presence? Maybe. Um, 
the thing is, there's no guarantee that's going to be a good movie. You know, I think there's many Hollywood movies have put in like internet influencers into movies and it hasn't made much of a difference in terms of the bottom line. So I think people, you know, are very wary of, of that as well, that if you have a million followers, it doesn't necessarily mean, what, you know, you're a good actor or, or you're the best actor for that role. So as I said earlier, you know, we would always be wary of, of you know, that being too much of an influencing factor. But, you know, closer to home, you can't ignore the Paul Mescal as a million on Instagram now or things like that, you know, so there are, but again, you know, a lot of the actors that have kind of really big following have the big following from, from the work they've done. You know, it's, you know, it's not like an easy thing where I say, Oh, I'm going to go out and get a million followers. Like it's not that easily done. You know, it's kind of the work often will kind of influence, you know, it often goes hand in hand. Um, so yeah, if, if there is an actor with a big following and it's a natural following and it's like, it's you know people seem to like the work they do yeah it, it is it's for us it's nice to have because if they're committed to supporting the film then you know they're communicating to one of the target audiences directly and that's an audience we don't have to spend money to advertise to in a way well we we can supplement it with advertising but it, it can be really good and you know we've had some good experiences in the past with some irish you know actors in in that regard and uh yeah um i would say one thing though at the at this present point in time, like, um, you know, everything online is quite, I think things are pretty sensitive out there. So like, if you're posting pictures of yourself on your socials of out and partying with 200 people and, you know, in the Berlin bar or something, you know, I think that may not stand you to good in a good place at the moment because the film said it's going to be very sensitive about COVID. So, you know, that is something maybe to be aware of, I would say for people watching that just to be a little bit careful on that side at the moment. So Tara, this is really kind of like, um, I'm thinking that maybe it's not so much a case of how many people are following you. It doesn't matter whether it's one or a million, it's kind of it's what you're saying and what you're putting out there because I guess it's, uh, it's very much part of your research for your interviews, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very much that, but, um, um, I mean, even, well, I, well, I would say I, Patrick, I think is a bit more scrupulous than some producers I know, because I know of casting decisions that have been made based on like Twitter followers and Instagram followers. I know quite a bit of them. Um, the, but I mean, even the, the COVID thing is a particular issue, but, but, but even, even we take that out of the, out of the equation, um, uh, we live in a we live at a sensitive moment regardless and and we we live in a moment um i mean there's an awful lot of talk about cancel culture and i'm not sure that um cancel culture is more prevalent than it was five years ago ten years ago but we do see that it happens very fast when it comes um and when and when the plug is pulled on you it is it is properly pulled um uh, like you're 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 gone you're you're out um and that's that's something to be incredibly wary of and um, the social media is a very, very powerful tool and it can be used um, against you very, very quickly. Um, and all you have to do is say the wrong thing. Bear in mind, Twitter, Instagram, any of these platforms, they are not neutral platforms. They represent certain kind, they have their own ideologies. They look like there's some kind of um, forum for free speech, but they're not a forum for free speech. And um, they, they, they all have their own set of values. And if you step beyond those, values that like we, we've seen this with you know people like jk rowling recently um like like so suddenly there are people burning their harry potter books um yeah i could think of better reasons to burn harry potter books but hey um the, 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 but the, but you know that's that's what it takes it takes it takes one thing and and and, and suddenly and and the other issue with a, a, a platform for example like um, Twitter is that, and, and we saw this recently, like the, the, there was a huge amount of reluctance to pull the plug on um, on a certain right wing Irish commentator long after she had like breached the rules in terms of um, incitement to hatred. There were, there were definite acts that were actual incitement to hatred and they put children in danger and, and, they, and, they, and they still left her on because they're mo mostly, mostly they care about the clicks, mostly they care about the views. And, and that's, that's ultimately their rationale. And it is in their best interest, if you study their algorithms, they want to radicalize you in certain ways because the more extreme your views are, the more likely you are to spend time on their platform. So you, you have to think about these things as, as tools. I think though, I, 
I think, for example, I mean, Instagram is potentially a great tool. Even TikTok is potentially a great tool for a certain kind of new performer that's emerging. I mean, last week for the newspaper, I interviewed Amy Simons, who I just think is so fantastic. I mean, I just in love with Amy Simons. I think she's so fantastic. Uh, creator of the Girlfriend Experience. She just directed her second feature, She Dies Tomorrow, which is this micro-budget science fiction, just really ingenious uh, um, film about a contagion in which you, you suddenly realize you're going to die tomorrow. Um, and, and, that, and once you're infected. And, and, it's, just, and it's just, it's, it's a brilliant little thing. But if you look at the cast of that film, and like, like Patrick knows this, and we often talk about this ourselves, this idea that like films now cost $200 million or they cost $200,000. And like the, 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 those, that kind of middle ground and those kind of big drama features are, are, are disappearing and things are becoming either bigger or smaller. And, and in that polarized market, there's kind of emerging a, a, a kind of new actor, um, more like an artist really rather than an actor they do everything they hold the boom they, they do editing they, they compose their own tunes they do and, and they and they all work on each other's films and if you look at the the cast list of she dies tomorrow like there's people like chris messina and i think there's about 12 people there with act, actors there with directing credits um, and i and i think and i think that's something that you can use your instagram accounts on or patreon account or whatever or whatever to uh, um and, and sort of build your profile that way um be the person who's going to hold the boom so where do you draw the line between using your your you know your not your fame but your you know your voice uh, as an artist to promote good causes like save the planet and climate change and that uh and then drifting into some things that for some people are maybe borderline like i know repeal was a big uh, con con mm -hmm. caused a lot of conflict between people at what point do you censor yourself as an artist in order to protect your career versus free expression? Um, oh, well, that's the... the you, there's you, can the, you can have the right free, you know, you can have free expression, just make sure it's the right free expression. <laughs> that's, yeah, that, that's, that's pretty much the, the answer. Um, I mean, if... I mean, repeal like hit at a certain moment, and, and like you know, it was it was pretty much a landslide majority, and it's like two thirds. So you can say, you know, at that point when you're involved in that cause, you're you're on the you're on the right side of history, and you're on the correct side of history. I think it's um, you know, I, I think it, you know, if, if it had been ten years earlier, it would have been a totally different story if you were using Twitter, um, uh, to 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 campaign for repeal, um, so. Well you can't you know, it, it, it's it's very hard to read a room it's very hard to know i mean but we do know there's certain trigger issues that are going to make you very very unpopular and and we do know as well that show business is generally speaking you know a, a liberal place i remember a couple of years ago when 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 i was in both street there was a young guy and he went well what if you believe in men's men's rights activism and what if you believe in that and it's like going well you're probably in the wrong business um, you should probably work somewhere else <laughs> It's tough. It's, um, it's, I think what we, what we want to take from this is the understanding that people in the industry look at, I know casting directors do it, I know you know this, Ali, as well, uh, particularly you, Tara, possibly Patrick as well. You'll look at these actors' Facebook pages, the Wikipedias, you'll see the photos of them out of their minds or whatever, and it's understanding that they finding the difference between their, their private uh, profile and their public profile and not to make sure that there's uh, that there's anything they have up there that shouldn't maybe be public domain because am I right in thinking anything they put up there is public domain Ali do you, you want to you want to jump in there for on that yeah I think I think I think really I think you know I, I understand the kind of the bigger kind of more complex uh, kind of political issues that people can get into but i think for most people who are listening to us today yeah. i think that your best guide like all careers is best practice you know and it's like if you understand the coordinates of best practice around you know getting into audition rooms you know introducing some people you know there's a lot of flexibility now around covid uh, that people can drop casting directors a line but you know a lot of casting directors they are like me, you know, they're over 50. They're not natives to all these platforms. They, they don't understand it as almost an extension of a avatar of yourself. You know, they read it like I read a newspaper 20 years ago, like we're not natives. Yeah. 
And a lot of those decision makers who are the gatekeepers, you know, casting directors like a bouncer on a club. You want to have the right clobber, the right looking labels and get in and then go crazy. You know, that's the, that's the deal, you know, and, and, and I think, I think best practice is that rule. And I think understanding that a lot of the people looking at, at anything you put online are, they are not natives the way the younger generation is. So they look at it quite differently. You know, I mean, it, I think that's an essential sort of tweak that we need to kind of be aware of for the, for, for the 82 young actors who are watching us now. I think, you know, I think they grew up with all these different platforms, um, but it's, it's older people like us who, yes, there'll be assistants and there'll be casting associates and there'll be young producers, but ultimately the eyes, you know, are a little older. So you just got to be a little bit, you know, more, I don't know, I suppose, reserved. And not even, you know, it's like if, the, if, if your politics or your politics or whatever it is, you have to be able to stand over that coherently and if you get drawn out and you can see that happening on all these different feeds you know sometimes my young kids they'll show me they'll say oh look this guy said this and it's quite you know and it can just stir up this bee's nest you know so if you can stand over anything that you're doing on your platform then you know I, I, I don't know I think I think that's okay as well and I think I think if you understand what are people connecting with in a performer, why does a performer kind of get such popularity? And I think a lot of the time people forget that it is, you know, if I if I'm watching something and I emotionally identify with the story that this performer is bringing me through, it's a very emotional, personal thing that a lot of the audience have. And, you know, a lot of people will forgive bad behavior because they really connect with the person the performer so I think if you always go back to that sort of thing about your charisma and what you can bring to the role and be quite confident about it you know in all aspects of when you're working a room when you're meeting casting directors producers you know it's and it's and it's an industry of relationships and it's an industry of networking and people like to work with people they know and people like to watch people they know we understand that why people become famous actors you know so i don't know it's kind of the micro become the macro whatever way that goes you know there's a, a lot of a lot of casting agreements now um will directly um address social media act activity so that's something to be aware of I, i'm not probably not in kind of very low budget films but once you get up to medium range kind of films and, and television, it, it is going to be in there in a couple of different forms, you know. Um, on the other end, you've got people like The Rock charging extra if he's going to promote it on Twitter or whatever. But, you know, in terms of the mid range, there will be something there that, you know, you're not to speak ill of the show and stuff like that, you know. So um, a couple of other things. You no know, taking pictures on the set, all that. Yeah, cause it, yeah just as an example, we, we worked on a film and there's like set pictures. And what happens is, when that goes up onto the internet, you know, some journalists, not the Irish Times journalists now, you know, it might just put in like, you know, a film title name into Google and images will come up and it could be unofficial images from these people's social media. And often they just take those, the first pictures they find and that goes out and it gets perpetuated. And then like anyone around the world puts in a movie title and these images are coming up first, you know. So it can be quite frustrating when you, as I said, when we try to position a film, we'll be very careful about the imagery we, we let out on it, so. This is an example just of a tweet that we use sometimes, I'm sharing screen, so hopefully you can all see that, where it's the actor was so excited to be involved in a, in a production, they put out the tweet, my character I voiced, and obviously a link to their Instagram with the picture of them in the costume and everything, and then the production company going, you're not to be supposed to be talking about this. Uh, Scarlet for you. Um, <laughs> uh, no. Yeah, I would say like if that was us, I don't think I'd do it in a public forum. I'd actually probably just call them and say, "Listen, can you delete that tweet?" You know, there's no point. Listen, I, I've, I've done it myself as well. I've called actors where they, um, I think they've just been so excited. It's that classic thing of taking photographs of yourself, yourself yeah. in the trailer, and it's wanting to share with the world. Look, I'm. I told you I was an actor. I'm a professional actor, but understanding that the um, the production owns that uh, and they can't control it once it's gone out there. But it is like, it's a fine line because you do want people to be, at the same time, you want people to be talking about it and you want awareness to be growing and you want people to be excited. It's just, you know, 
it, it depends what level you're working at. You know, if you're doing a kind of a low budget Irish film and we're kind of managing the release here, we're not a massive company, you know, you can be a bit more flexible on it and you can get like, ah, oh, that's fine. Let's, let's go for it. You know, if it's all in a kind of relatively managed way, you know, wouldn't be kind of, you know, work like a kind of studio or one of the massive platforms. And we do work with them quite a lot. And, you know, we do see the difference uh, to protectiveness over uh, but yeah, it, it can be tough, you know, because on one side you're trying to promote, everyone's trying to promote it and get a bigger audience to see it in time and then, but you can only do it in a certain way. So, yeah. We have a, re a really good question from Sarah, which I'll come to in a minute, because I just want to come back to you, Tara, first. Mm -hmm. um, I think you had something you want to uh, come in on there. I was just going to say about um, best, just to continue on what Ali was saying about best practice and just to go back and to reiterate very strongly about um, making sure you watch actors on TV, making sure you read interviews with actors so you can see how it's done. Um, but one thing I, I really, really want to stress about this is that um, there's this kind of perception, well, I've come across this in, in your room so many times before and, and you have to try and kind of knock it out of people a little bit, um, that the journalist is somehow out to get you. Um, one of the things, uh, the, one of the reasons why it's best practice to be familiar with how actors are interviewed in newspapers is that you will come to know the, and there's not many of them, but there are a few journalists like Lynn Barber or whoever who are hatchet jobs. They, they are brought in specifically if they're coming through your door you're, you're going to have a really bumpy ride and um, they, they that's what they do they do they do full takedowns and they're very very good at them so you need to be familiar with media in order to know um, those people and in order to avoid them um, but the other thing is is that 99% of journalists and, and maybe even more than that want to be your friend you might win an oscar one day and you they'll get invited to the party so they want to be your friend and they want to present you in a good way and they want they want you to tell three funny stories that they can put in print and they want and they want you, and they want you to, to to read well because it's it's in the journalist's best interest for you to read well on the page it's 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 as much it's in as much in my interest as it is in your interest doing the interview um so so that's something to think about the journalist is there they want to work with you and they, they, they want to be an active participant in your storytelling. So, so, rem so remember that and, and, and try and work with them and try and give them something to work with. How do you think, um, in your experience, Tara, actors let themselves down in these interviews? Um, just it's like sometimes you'll come across actors and they really just haven't, if like if you sit down and watch like the old classic, I mean it's sort of changed now a little bit. But if you sit down and you watch the old classic um, U.S. late night TV format, um, and and they'll and they'll come in and and they'll they'll sit down and they'll they'll run, they'll have already talked to I don't know how many production assistants and researchers before this, and so and they'll they'll have whittled it down into you know sort of three or four anecdotes about the time George Clooney came on set or whatever. And, that, and that's, what you, that's what you need to do. You need to do that process yourself um, before you sit down with a journalist. You need to have some story about your childhood, have some story about how you got into acting, ha have an idea of the kind of questions that you're gonna be asked and have an idea about how, how you want the answers to read and to sound when they, when they come out of, out of your mouth. Um, you know, you know, ultimately, you are there like, to, to entertain people and you have to think of it as part of that process. Um, and let me jump in with Sarah's question here because it's kind of interesting. And I hear this a lot actually. Uh, she says, I don't have a Twitter account and my Instagram is on private because I like to have minimal social media presence. Do you think this may affect a casting director's decision to cast me when they try to look me up and they can't find me? Do I become a ghost to them? And in that sense, because they can't get an impression of my personal life, I like to keep it private. But well, first, I think a little mystery goes a long way. And I, I think it's fair to say, guys, that you don't have to have a, um, a, social, a social media account uh, of any kind. You don't have to have a presence. What do you think? I, 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 I can't speak for, you know, being a casting director. But, you know, as I said, that stuff, it's like a bonus. We never really like to think of it as a core, you know, reason why, why something like that why someone may or may not be in, in, in a project, you know? Ali? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you know, I mean, there's, there, it's like that thing, there's as many exceptions that prove the rule, you know? 
it's some people like they you know they unplug and they just do it that way um but i do feel that a lot of people who who are very successful particularly our bigger um, male actors in this country and a lot of them don't carry big profiles on social media but when you meet them in the room they are professional networkers like you know i've, I've well I, I haven't been around many of them but i've seen them you know at festivals sometimes you know after first nights at certain theater you know openings and you know they're really they you know they're just like exactly what you were saying earlier about Tom Cruise on the red carpet you know they understand the business and they understand the game and they they they're very personal you know it's it's kind of interesting to watch um to watch them work you know um um but i think more and more for younger for the younger actors i think these platforms they're all there a lot of them are on it but again it's for every for everyone that is there's probably somebody really successful that unproves the rules so i think it is a personal choice and i think ultimately casting directors directors producers financiers distributors everybody they're trained to see a performance as an audience is and if you can hit that it's kind of you know Tara, I think um, one name that jumps out for me who, who uh, when his career was developing, had no interest in any of that at all was Killian Murphy, uh, who's only just beginning, seems to be a lot more comfortable now with doing media as such, but it certainly didn't hurt his career. Uh, yeah. No, he's always done select interviews. Like he's always talked to us, so I can't complain. But the, but the, he he has always done some. He all has always cherry picked certain interviews. He's just been a lot more uh, careful. I mean, that it's also worth saying that was then I personally think you need to have a digital profile. Um, and I understand that, you know, you know, it might not be fair and you might, and you might want to have your private life, but it's, it's probably worth having maybe to think about a public persona and to think about, to think about what you're a, a side of yourself that you're comfortable with pushing out there and, and using this and using social platforms, using digital platforms as you know I think the the phrase I always use is treat them like they're a rolling billboard they're a rolling billboard of you and treat them treat them like they're part of your art treat treat, treat them like they're part of your work um and and just and, and just find a way into them just so that there's some kind of footprint there um that, that you're visible um I I think without that I think you're gonna it, it could potentially I think you're just making life hard for yourself but I think it's also a case of establishing, you know, the difference between Sarah the actress and Sarah the personal mm -hmm. person, and that you can have uh, maybe Sarah official yeah, uh, as, the, exactly. as your professional account for all of these social medias, where I don't know whether it was you, Tara, or maybe it was Ali, who made a really good point about this is how you can control the information that goes out there about you. So it's whether it's the two or three headshots that you want to put out, the bio, the updates that are coming directly from you. That's so it's the one central source of you. If you don't have your own website, which can be a little pretentious sometimes if you yeah. don't have a huge amount, that you can have both type of accounts, can't you? Yeah, yeah. I said no. I think you, there's a you can have a private account and a public account, and I, you know, and there and there are privacy um, um, settings. And um, someone's just asked there which digital platform for the most useful. Um, honestly, in 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 2020, it's Insta. It that's that's just it's Insta. That's what it is. Um, uh, and and you know, it it's, it also can be used for really nice um, uh, casting shots and things. So, yeah, Ali, were you going to come in there? Yeah, I was about to say that, um, you know, I think I think they call them, don't they, kind of shadow profiles, you know, so you can have your professional profile. Um, you know, I know in your in I suppose I, I would be of the opinion, maybe it's because I'm uh, I'm not a native. I've just uh, migrated and kind of conquered Twitter a little bit. But um, I think Twitter uh, is it's a place of business. I, uh, I was talking yesterday with Nicola, who does some of our Twitter and just about this session. And we were kind of agreeing that with a lot of the business of film, um theater it's it's on it's it's on twitter 
you know the so so the more the more as a performer that you you know are there in a professional capacity ultimately by following you're almost editorializing it you know you're you're actually creating your own news feed about whatever industry interest and focus that you're following through professionally through your career and so i think i think twitter twitter is it's sort of a must you know just to be in the know because on a lot of platforms, young performers can miss out on a lot of workshops or news or opportunity because they're not in the right groups or, you know what I mean? Whereas Twitter, if you just get into the habit of following, following industry production companies, casting directors, studios, you know, like there's so many ways that you just start to kind of editorialize your news feed. It's like reading it like a, you know, like an industry paper, I suppose. Um, Patrick, COVID. Yeah. So, oh, go on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> an ambush. Uh, where, where is this going? Where? What's happening? Uh, um, yeah. Well, stuff <laughs> shooting this week. You know. Um, you know, there's Irish projects kind of back up and running now in terms of production, in terms of distribution. You know, there wasn't much studio films in July and August. We'd ten it out this week. Sorry, not we. I mean, sorry, the world had tenet out this week. Uh, but it did provide a bit of an opportunity over the last few weeks for us. You know, we work for companies in the UK called Altitude and Vertigo, who kind of release a lot of films in this period. And, you know, stuff like the Russell Crowe film Unhinged, who, by the way, is great value at the moment on Twitter. And, you know, an Irish radio station tweeted him last week asking for an interview. And he, he replied to them on Twitter, giving them an interview. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, so we had Unhinged and then a couple of kids' films like 100% Wolf and... Pinocchio so that like those are films that normally would have probably struggled to find a place theatrically but because there hasn't been much out you know they did kind of got screens and you know the decent numbers so um I haven't seen the tenant numbers yet I think they're being kind of held back for a couple of days but um you know cinemas are talking about sold out screenings now there is reduced capacity so you know from my side of you know in terms of exhibition distribution there definitely seems to be I think it might be all right, you know. I'd say where it might, like they did say, um, true studies, it's kind of families and films aimed at core, more kind of mainstream. We, will People will come out for that, that, but the older demographic might be slower to come out for cinemas. So, you know, naturally they would be a core audience of the art house circuits, let's say. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see how, how that side, but if you're thinking of kind of mainstream multiplex, which I'd say in the long term, if the social distancing thing can be, resolved or reduced in time then i'd say it'll be fine and production stuff's happening people are finding a way to shoot uh responsibly and safely so actors it, might okay. to... it might be i am an optimist anyway so you know but i think yeah, it might be okay be really. yeah and i patrick i just want to i just want to say i mean we have had a lot of uh, cast irish specifically casting breakdowns on spotlight in the last while like you know so producers and directors and cast and crew are really getting ahead of covid covid compliance on set like they're working really hard it's kind of fascinating to watch how quickly you know I'm sure if somebody was watching us all on earth, you see these producer director people adapting, like they're the early adopters, you know. Yeah, and, and there might there might be opportunities for, you know, where there might be projects to say, oh, let's bring in people from the US or from, you know, Europe or the UK. Like, oh, well, let's see if we can cast Irish in the first instance, you know, they don't have to come in, they don't have to kind of self-isolate, you know. So yeah. there might be opportunities on, on local productions a bit more uh, than, than there used to be, you know, in the short term at least. And and Terry, I guess you're not doing a lot of uh, flying to uh, to junkets around the world anymore. No, no, I no, and I really miss flying. That used to be my hour of like no, no anybody. I and I I could read books. It was like such an amazing luxury. And so oh God, no, I do I do miss flying, but. Well, we'll see. But but I've actually gotten very, I mean, they, they very quickly, you know, particularly the big studios um, adapted and like I did the Tenet Junket and I did and did, did all those by Zoom. And it, it's quite weird because, you know, suddenly you're in Kenneth Branagh's front room um, or, you know, or somebody's bedroom. Um, and, and But 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 oddly, I can, and I was just talking about this yesterday um, when I was, was interviewing um, Sally Potter by Zoom, and she it was it was that 
it, it's that thing of like, cause people are now sitting in their front room a lot of the time, they're actually quite relaxed and you can get quite good interviews out of it. Um, rather than, you know, having one journalist heard it in for 20 minutes and then another heard it in for 20 minutes and in, in on this kind of revolving door thing that in a, some hotel room in London. So it, it actually has worked out rather well. And I suspect given the amount of money that some of the studios are saving um, by doing, by having all their interviews on Zoom, um, the, the Zoom thing was probably likely to continue um, for quite some time. So I don't know when I'll, when I'll get back to London. And um, by the time I do anyway, there'll probably have barbed wire around it post Brexit or whatever. Yeah. And you'll have to isolate for, for five years when you come back as well, because yeah. you wouldn't know. It. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so I think what we might do is we're going to take a short break before we go into the second half. Patrick, have you anything else you'd like to uh, to contribute in Tara? I mean, um, no, it's just as said, you know, in kind of times like that, you know, there's always opportunity, you know. So, you know, yeah, I, I think things will be okay. And yeah, I would say on the social media and kind of branding, it's always good to have, but it's not, you know, I think being a good actor is kind of more important. Yeah, I think you're, I, I agree. I think we can we can sometimes get hung up on the idea of of our um, of our media brand as such to a certain extent. Um, Tara, um, I think just to summarize, yeah. get your social media shit together. Differentiate between your personal and your private. Understand that you're working with the journalist. That it's not a defensive thing. That they're not out to get you. Mm -hmm. Have your answer prepared like a good politician. Know what it is you're going to say. Understand that if you're talking to Tara at Irish Times, it's going to be different to somebody with a tabloid or a different kind of magazine. Uh, and and what else? Yeah, no, no, that, that, that just worth reiterating. Journalists are your friend, um, unless it's a very specific kind of journalist, but they're very well known and they're very easy to identify. There, there's a very small number of them that are, that are going to actually, you know, go out to do a takedown on, on an actor or or anybody else but but i i would say as well like you know if you if you go over to youtube and you look at the sort of really classic chat show era it's actually worth looking at like the really great raconteurs um you know the, the days when like terry wogan was he was, was was running his show or whatever and th there are certain people like well obviously peter o'toole or or, or people or people like um, peter ustinoff and those and th if you get a sense of those kind of great i mean those people were almost as well known for their interviews as they as they were for anything that they did on film, and they they just you know they could command a room you know telling some story and the, and the way and look at how they 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 construct the story and how they structure the punchline and and have a look at have a look at those people who are really good at this shit and and get and get a sense of what it is to be really good at this shit because it's an art it is it really is an art of itself and and like say the say it's the same with your instagram same with everything else just regard it as part of your work regard it as as and and make it make it make it make it art art make it like your art and think of it like your art yeah uh, especially if you if you are representing yourself, be your own business manager, your own agent, and 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 get up and put the professional hat on, and as opposed to the performer artist. So, all right, listen, thank you so much, Tara and Patrick, for your time. Uh, wishing you guys both the best going forward. Ali, you're going nowhere. You're staying right here. Uh, <laughs> we'll give you guys a chance to uh, to say goodbye, um, and then I think we'll just continue on with the the, the second part because we've got a bit of flow here. Um, all right, thanks, guys. All right. Yeah, thanks for having us. I, I was, I was absolutely lovely, and best of luck to everybody, and um, and good luck with your voice, Ali. I hope it holds up. Thank you. Thanks. See Bye. you guys. See you. Bye. So, Ali. Yes. Here we are. So the first thing I think we wanted to talk about was the idea of the headshot because it's become it's almost the first thing a casting director or an agent is, is going to see of you is like literally the the thumb the thumbnail you know yes. and and the importance of a really good headshot and what makes a good headshot and you are something of a special specialist in this field my opening line on all of this is you are working inside a very visual medium you know everybody in this business is trained visually 
you know so when you see in those sort of you know photo shoots of models where there's guys looking through magnifying kind of little things and all of the what what appear to us to be a thousand of uh, the same picture of a model male or female or whatever for that shot that pops that is true you know th that happens people are trained visually to understand finding that photo that pops and i know shimmy we've talked a lot about this i think you know this is where technology is your friend you know you have your phone you can go outside with a with a mate with a partner whatever tell jokes jump up and down run through the forest get used to looking at yourself you know a photo a headshot just so that we're on the same jumping off point. Caesar did it first on the coin and the queen does it best on the stamp. Oh. It is from there to an inch above your head, okay? There's a lot of mid shots and indoors and outdoors. The headshot has been radically revolutionized, okay? Um, it was quite formal, it was quite black and white. It was quite, you know, there's also, but what is an amazing thing about looking back at the old books of Spotlight, even though there's only an inch around the human head, you can pinpoint most headshots exactly to the decade in which they were taken, be it the quality of the film, be it the lighting, the style of the clothes. Like, it's amazing. The it's hair. amazing. You know, it's just everything. It's, it's so bizarre that we are so trapped in our time. Um, but previously, people would spend a lot of money on these sessions. They'd go in, they'd hand themselves over, and they end up with the same photo. You are not there to pose as a, as a model. You are not that. It's not about your looks. A headshot is about doing something sort of strangely dynamic within the session of being able to spontaneously capture a bit of your charm, a bit of your persona, a bit of your soul. I don't know what it is, you know, but you need to create hacks so that when you're in that studio, that like when you're on a set or whatever it is where your where your career takes you, that you can just hack straight into that energy and bring it up with the photographer. And a lot of people don't understand that. And they go in and they're really disappointed because they have the same photo repetitiously of them posing in different tops, indoors, outdoors, blah, blah, blah. And it doesn't punch. And you need to do your prep work. You need to get somebody taking pictures of you on a nice day you need to understand what because once you start to see it you're training your eye you you know going around using the internet looking at other people's profiles at their agents pages studying the headshot you know when i started uh with leo and them you know i was handed a book of contacts and i was told learn all the agents you know, that's what I did for six weeks. I familiarized myself with the market as a casting as a, as casting assistant. You have to know, like, you know, you have to understand. And that is very similar for, I think, a performer and, a, and an actor. They have to study the art form and all the agents' pages, most of them are open. You can look at people's headshots. You can study headshots ad infinitum. We're going to look. Yeah, we're going to look at some in a moment. Um, but it's really. I think we've compared this. The idea that you don't go into the hairdressers and say, "Knock yourself out. Do what you want with my head." You know, you yeah. quite often you've put a bit of thought into it. You have a look or something or even images to share. It's the same for headshots. Really, is to like you say, do your research and understand so that when you go to the photographer, you're almost directing them, uh, or, it's a, or it's a collaboration at least. It's not just well, I don't know what to do. You just take a photo of me. Yeah, absolutely. And you know yourself, I mean, like, you know, like everything in life, if, if you're, if, if somebody is a photographer and, you know, they, obviously there will be some sort of communication prior to the session. And if you have a buzzer who's going, hey, listen, I took all these photos. Here's the four I really like. You know, maybe you could have a look at those. They kind of turn me on. I think there might be, you know, this is what I did. I was reading poetry to my mom in the garden and then I was telling jokes in this one. Uh, would it be cool if I did that with you? You know, I was on a trampoline. You know, who cares? Like if, you know, if photographers are quite creative. You know, if you vibe with them, it's like everything else. It's collaborative. And they'll go, actually, this is kind of groovy. Yeah, let's go. 
and they'll do it. They'll go with you to get you that shot. They want to get you that shot. You know, nobody wants to end up with a really wooden on the nose headshot that people are kind of going, oh, thanks. And it's like you said about going into the room and taking control of it, Jimmy, you know? Um, let's look at a few of these uh, examples now. And I should say up front, I'm just going to show the screen. That right. the examples we're looking at, they're not recommendations or endorsements from Spotlight or Bow Street. These are just three random photographers that I, I'm somewhat familiar with. Um, so it's not, we're not suggesting these are the three that you approach. There's multiple excellent headshot photographers in the, in the country um, that you should research for yourself. And as Ali says, nearly all the agents' uh, websites are open, so you can look at those headshots there and see ones that you like uh, and find the photographer. Um, there's some here for us to look at. Uh, this is Lorna Fitzsimons, who I know because she's done a lot of Bow Street students uh, right just in the past. This is a variety of stuff from your kind of more traditional there's, I think it's Fionn, is it, from Amber, uh, Daily Number and um, Handsome Devil and Normal People. That's one of the more traditional verses, something that's a little bit more moody. I don't know if moody is the right word. There's two kind of styles here, really, isn't there, Ali? There's the kind of the traditional look and then there's something that's a little bit more street. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you'll see that more and more that because there is this new sort of breath being, you know, allowed within the headshot, you know, there is the traditional headshot, which is what I described as being the traditional. Um, and some of these are what we would call more editorialized, you know, where they're a bit more like artist maker kind of probably some of these are used being used for exactly what we were discussing with Patrick and with Tara, you know, for, um, you know, selling different, uh, marketing for films or productions. And then some of them are your standard headshots, which, you know, Lorna has a really distinctive paired back and, I mean, I don't know of anybody that is looking at these with us. Like, you can see the variety and the range, how flexible she is with working with all these different actors. You know, there, there almost isn't one photo that there's a very similar thing happening. You know, she's changing the background. They're either in black and white or they're in color against black and white. Like, it's... There's such a versatility. And I, think, I would say that she's tailoring that to the vibe of the person. That's the key. It's the individual uniqueness of the personality that comes across that I think the actor has to allow, find a way to expose that makes it stand out. Yeah, and I think, I think that's why I think, you know, the more that you prepare for these, the more that you train your eye to look at how these different performers to, to what they're doing in the photo. And the more that you are able to have that sort of term terminology kind of conversation with, with, with your headshot photographer, you know, it's, it creates a certain synergy and an energy and, you know, it's, it's just fascinating to watch, but, you know, for, for a lot of these, um, these photos where they're editorial um, I think a lot of people will lead on their profiles with a standard shot be it in color black and white studio or outdoor and then they'll follow up with some of these more editorial modern sort of feeling you know photos that they use and they kind of give a sense sometimes of as though they're on a set or, you know, it's a stills photo and that's becoming, you know, more and more used in people's profiles. It's very interesting how, you know, ev even agents are kind of taking control of the, the, the image of their clients um, and moving away from the more maybe traditional standard, you know, headshot photo. Uh, it's just, it's always interesting to watch. And it's interesting, you know, if you're interested in being represented by a specific agency, you know, it's a really good idea to obviously have a really good look around the clients that are on their, on their books. You know, it's, all this is open to you. And 
you can learn a lot from the headshots that are used on their books and you know it's it's just a it's it's research research you have to do that this is so more these are, headshots with steve murray uh great just pages for loading yeah but you can see that obviously the, the way that he's laying this out is also very contemporary and sort of studio and very similar um contemporary feel it's very i think it's very clever like lorna's and you know there's a lot of thought about background and setup and indoors and outdoors and you know just almost almost sort of mirroring the personality of the of the subject within the photo yeah you know and and i think i think that's something that everybody that is listening has probably given some thought to i guess the skill is also in trying to lose all self consciousness and and to develop a kind of a, a kind of very objective critical eye and not to look in terms of whether you're concerned about whether you've got like a spot on your face or a wrinkle or whatever that you're looking for something a little bit more what we will what we would call in both you i guess a sense of ownership you know yes. confidence self belief this is who i am i don't need to put a mask on to pretend i'm something i'm not i know who i am i'm confident in that and this is and this is who i am yeah absolutely and you can see you can see that a lot of a lot of the a lot of these photos are very confronting aren't they they're very direct yeah you know it's almost like these actors are able to sort of almost just be very naked to us like they're looking to us like it's a very stylistic decision you know and that and that is not an easy thing to achieve you know what i mean it's kind of i mean anybody who knows about having their photo taken they know it can be very hit and miss whereas all of these have a beautiful soulful kind of insight perspective on the person i think they're so very that's if you want to work with them absolutely there's an intimacy i think that i'm seeing in all of steve's work here it's very it's very intimate. I feel like this person is looking at me. Only me. Yes. It's yeah, you know? yeah, absolutely. And I think that's what I was saying even in the conversation we were having previously is you know a lot of people they wonder, you know, how do certain performers get so much purchase with people? And I think I think it's that thing, isn't it? It's that emotional directness with the audience. And I think there's something really fantastic about the quality that he's capturing in all of these. It's it's very moody and it's very intimate. I think it's Quite. also it's it's a combination of the skill of the photographer to relax person as well. In the same way, a director on set, you know, a good director will you know create a nice relatively calm environment to allow you to bring to bring yourself and feel that sense of vulnerability for what you do um but you get the sense that these people have really taken charge of this as well and they may have probably done uh the advice you used to give was go to the phoenix park and take 400 shots uh, on your phone and just go back and look at them and see why does one seem to stand out more than others absolutely and that's what i'm saying about using your phone get somebody to go with you and to begin to take your photo, you know, get used to having your photo taken, get used to looking at yourself, um, get used to understanding what you were doing, what you were thinking in those shots. And once you begin to, you know, once you begin to identify the photos, then you begin to identify what you were doing because it's, it's all a bit too much to start trying to learn all of that in your first or your second headshot session you need to prepare what what it is you're trying to do and and i think even looking at those photos i mean and even with lorna's you can see the confidence with which both of those photographers are capturing those images there's so much control to achieve those sort of shots in that sort of 
kind of serenity that's the word isn't it there's a certain serenity and we all know how tricky that can be to achieve when you're in a studio when you know that all of that people can get a little bit overwhelmed and you know the the, the that sort of narrative relationship between you and the pho- photographer can become a little bit jarring whereas i think with both of those selections of headshots you can see something very crafted and intimate and it's kind of interesting even because I suppose because since we've been doing this um shimmy we would have always checked in on those photographers and you can see can't you with this kind of you know the way they say that rising tide lifts all but you can see even in their in their um in their websites you can see how they have grown professionally you can see suddenly their understanding and their presentation of their clients and the headshots they've done you can see their 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 growth it's kind of fascinating to watch well it is it's kind of like uh, more more as more and more people come into the industry as well you know there's more talents there's more people like uh there wasn't as big a tradition of, of upskilling and training in this country. I know the Americans have always led the way on that. They're always doing a, a course on something or whatever. And I think Irish actors are really embracing that and have been for a while. Um, that everyone is like, it's not good enough just to rest in my laurels. I need to keep up in my game, even as a, as a photographer or whatever, whatever it is they're doing. And, and that's the thing, you know, people say to me, how often should you be having your headshot taken and really professionally you know, every two years, you know, that is really the kind of, the, the advice, you know, I mean, it is your business card. It is, you know, there's something, there's something about keeping it fresh and with the times and snappy and, you know, the amount of conversations that I will have and career advice sessions with actors all over the world. And the first thing they say is, Oh, you know, the, these these are really old headshots. They're out of date. I, this isn't me. And you're kind of going, okay. So if I'm if I'm a casting director and I've logged into my Spotlight account and I have a thousand suggestions, your thumbnail photo, you're telling me ignore that. You know, you're kind of going, no. They, they won't thank you, the casting director, for wasting their time if you come in for an audition and they discover you don't really look as young as you're youthful as your as your headshot is because you haven't changed it it's kind of like it's not really done is it it's not good etiquette yeah it's just but it but it's just it's telling that the amount of conversations that i have with the performers i would say 40 to 50 percent of those conversations begin with i'm not happy with my headshot these headshots are old I don't look like they're from like the amount of things that begin. And it's just, that is, that is like, it is, it is within the business. A good headshot will get you into the room. If I'm sitting there and I open an envelope or I open the email and there's something within the headshot that is sparky and catches my attention, casting directors, agents, everybody in the business is trained to your headshot. And they'll read it in a second. Absolutely. And it's what, it's what will make people pick up the phone, get you in the room. It's, 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 and, and, and people, a lot of people, you know, they don't understand the casting, like, you know, once a project is funded, you know, and you know that Jimmy, once the money hits, everybody's there. It's like, you're creating this bubble and you've got this massive time pressure and casting everything begins really intensely and it's a really fast moving company to achieve the the shoot of the of the script within this time frame and everybody's under pressure like that's why people who work crews cast they work in film it's consuming you know and casting happens under a lot of pressure there's a lot of yes no yes no decisions like that and they are based on the headshot you talked about the idea that you know in the back in the days it was was the 10 by 8 the glossy yes because of the internet it's like it's thumbnails or whatever so in relation to the power of a really good image to stand out as a thumbnail if you extend that to the idea of the business card which i know we've had some questions about 
Where were you on the idea of actors having business cards and maybe their, their thumbnail on that as well on the card? I suppose, I suppose I'd be wondering about the business card. Do they just hand those out? Well, I guess it's maybe meeting people at festivals or maybe you go to a premiere or Absolutely. something. Great idea. Really clever. Here's you know, my card. It doesn't seem to... Yeah, but, but like, how many times have you got home from a festival and a week later when you kind of clear your head, you open up your dirty laundry or whatever bag and there's 14 business cards. Everything's been crammed into the end of the bag. And you pick them up and you go, who are these people? How drunk was I? Yeah, who, who is the head of whatever? Who is the co-executive of whatever? Because we can't visually connect them. Whereas actually for an actor, I think that's a fantastic idea to have a little card with your, with your headshot on it. Why not? Right. You know? Yeah. Because I think the beauty of the business card, it's like it gives you a reason to go over and introduce yourself to a cast and director or an agent as a festival. I know a lot of actors, a lot of actors, believe it or not, are introverted. And they, don't, they hate the idea of having to network as such. Whereas if you have a card, you can just go over and go, sorry to interrupt, sorry to disturb you. I just wanted to say hello and here's my card. And it's done. And they yeah. will thank you for not boring the ear off them or chatting them, that they'll just take the card and they go, okay, well, you know, there's interesting in my check on that, you know, follow up yeah. on that. But I, I like that there's a visual reference on it because my issue is I get a lot of business cards and I don't really know who they're from after a while. Yeah. Um, do we want to take a look at um, and some really good questions coming in as well about showreels. Do we want to talk about that briefly? Yeah, I love talking about showreels. I think what I'd like to do for showreels is what I might do is I've actually got a, um, a short three minute video that I can share about, uh, about showreels because I will often talk myself about showreels and people just don't listen. They just hear it, but they don't actually go, no, 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 I know best. So I'd like to show this clip uh, about uh, showreels. And I think it's actually one made by Spotlight as well. Oh, great. Uh, and it's only, three, it's only three minutes long. So a showreel is very simply uh, some video material of you acting on camera. It doesn't need to be any more or any less than that. It's not about having a great film showreel. It's not about having lots of television drama. Obviously, if you've got that, it's great and so much the better. Hopefully that's gonna accrue in time. Um, but in a very simple terms, it's, it's just having something that we can see of you on camera. The beginning of the showreel is really, really important. It's like anything. It's like opening a book. It's the, you know, it's the first page. So it's good to have very strong opening. Brevity is good. Um, always start with your best piece of work. Two minutes is t uh, long enough, three minutes is plenty long. No long, long sequences. Something that makes them want to see more. There may be some things that you'd love to have on there, um, but be quite brutal with yourself. So just because you're crying in a scene doesn't mean it should automatically go on to your, your showreel and believe it or not that's something that does come up quite a lot. It's good to have as much material on of, you know, recent times, don't make it all, all old material. Good stuff, not lots of stuff. If you've done ten, 10 films, don't put 10 films. Don't put all the stuff you've ever done into one showreel. Good material, the best of, you know, even if it's like one short scene. If you don't have two or three scenes, one good one is enough. Yeah. And that's really all you need. Yeah. If you haven't got good material, just don't. Never show anything that's not going to show you in a favourable light. So don't confuse it with a scene with lots of other people. Just show absolute clips of just you and one other person, if at all possible. Sometimes a director will say, which actor am I looking at? So in that, you know, to, you do need, I think, where possible, to gear the showreel, obviously, around yourself. Um, but I don't think you need to start going, you know, consciously editing people out. I don't like having to skip through three or four minutes in order to find somebody's best work. And I absolutely no no to um, a soundtrack beginning, you know, like a montage. Again, that's just a yeah. waste of time. I don't need a montage of musical stuff at all. I need the scenes. No montages because we don't want to scroll through them. Montages are all about editors. Um, good showreels are all about actors. So be selfish. I want to see you talking and acting and moving around as soon as possible. I don't want to see um, you running across a field with um, the Who playing in the background. It's never the Who. I hate them. 
I hate them. Um, I have been quoted before, and I'll say it again. I don't care what you look like to music. I would rather there's more time for the scenes so I can get a nice uh, variation of different roles that you may have played. I would reinforce a showreel as a simple thing. It's not complicated. It's not about something beautiful. It's just about something nuts and bolts practical, which is some quick, accurate video. I think more and more it is becoming accessible and allowed that you will just make a very clean self-tape scene that would be a minute, a minute and a half long. And that is admissible to be put onto your showreel on, on Spotlight. You know, totally, yeah. Like and you can... Saying your own self-tapes is far, is far more useful to a casting director. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and but but there is this sort of duality of, you know, people do people do like to use footage that has been shot professionally, even if it is outdated, it establishes the longevity or who they've worked with. There's a lot of reasons people might. Um, but I think I think I think you can kind of maybe do a little bit of a mix or whatever it is, if you want to keep some of that footage. But it's like everything, it's about, isn't it? It's about focusing in on what you're talking about, Jimmy, on taking control of it and of watching enough of it and, you know, having a good, somebody from the business with a good eye to have a look and a pass at what you're putting up. My worry for a lot of young performers is that, like you say, Shimmy, people say, oh yeah, I know about self-taping. And they don't listen. And then when you look at it, you know, there's crazy stuff happening in the way that they're filming themselves, like really basic sort of mistakes that are, you know, that would just knock them out of being considered. It's very easy on film to, 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 to appear amateur by making very simple mistakes. And that's why I am would be a little cautious about saying to people, oh yeah, just put up three self-tapes. You know, there is a lot of skill in getting to a good self-tape. And, you know, it's a lot of it is about repetition and reviewing and getting industry opinion about your one and a half minute scene. And I'm a great believer in, I think, I don't know if you agree, you know, a lot of the work you have to do is to find the character that you resonate with. Uh, like, there's... I th yes, absolutely. I think, first of all, you've got to know your type. Yes. Um, but I also believe that the advantage of a self-tape, even if it's just one clip within the showreel, allows you to show a little bit of range. Because if you are, I use this example an awful lot, if you're you know, a six foot five guy with muscles out to here, uh, and you're probably sick of being cast as gangster number three or bouncer number four, that you know, is a chance to shoot a scene where there's something maybe a little bit more sensitive about the character that you play. Absolutely, and that's the thing that people find. They go, why do I keep getting cast as a butler, say, okay? And then I go, because you did it brilliantly once, you put that footage up, no. and then you sent out, the next time you did it, you added that. So now your entire showreel is you as a butler. Yeah. So casting people are going, oh yeah, he'll be great as the butler. And there's no way in using old footage that exactly that you can reach into something new and you can stretch your edge and your performance and kind of do something groovy. Whereas self-tape gives you a lot of authority and a lot of freedom and a lot of ability. But it also requires a lot of preparation, I think, and a lot of, you know, work to get to that point and I'm a great believer in you know not writing your own scenes because I think that you know I, I personally think that there is there is like with similarly to what we were talking about about best practice that the industry offers you know through concept script editing script development funding production all the things that sort of put the story through the fire to get it to the screen. I think that that, that, that inherently that the story has gone through that best practice process. And what you see the end is the tight character 
that works within the production. And I don't think if you start writing your own stuff that that works. The problem is when you write your own stuff is that you're now subservient to your skill as a writer and you're trying to show how good your writing is and the actor, that's not their job at all. Exactly, exactly, yeah. And then uh, people forget that there was great writing before 2016. You know, mm. there's some amazing writing from characters back there from the last century, from the 1980s down to the 50s. So, <laughs> you know, not all of it is dated as such. Uh, don't do something, which I'm seeing an awful lot of, of very contemporary films, like, you know, whether it's Lady Bird or The Joker or um, Beautiful Boy. There's so many films and, and risk being compared to those great actors that are still very much fresh in the mind of the cast and directors because we only saw them two years, three years ago. Yeah, and I mean, there's certain, there's probably certain scenes that people will really say, don't do the scene in the room in, is it Goodwill Hunting? With him and, you know, with the, with the guy, um, Mork. Robin Williams. Yeah. You know, and they have that, that kind of like, confrontation Goodwill hunting yeah in goodwill hunting Not people say fault. don't do that yeah. because it's done so much you know there's there's certain and that's what i'm saying i think that a lot of performers they don't do the heavy lifting in the research like there's there's so many clever ways to find be it older productions or lesser characters in productions you know there's so many clever ways that you can and you know pick out a character um, to prepare a scene, but also stay away from big emotional arcs, trying to establish those in a self-tape, you know, try like, and, and I kind of am worried about even using the word self-tape because a self-tape in the business is now being given an audition to go home and to film instead of going to the first round of a casting. Yeah. But what we're talking about is choosing and finding a character and a scene that pushes your any sort of typecasting for you that you are specifically going to film for your showreel okay I should, yeah I should. tape it at home yourself so it is a self-tape but it, it, it can never be an audition it can never be anything like that it's something that you're putting a lot of time in because you don't want to be typecast for the professional footage that you have already or for the fact that you don't have professional footage already. Yes. So this is this great opportunity. Like, you know, it's it's really new and it's seminal for young performers that you can do this. And it gives you so much authority, but you do have to do it very cleverly. There is no fixed uh, rules on this, I should add, because yeah. some questions have come in have are, are rightly talking about conflicting opinions cultural differences, UK, American, um, and that some say don't use a showreel company, some say do, some say I don't want self-tapes on your showreel or such. I think it's important to remember that if your performance is bringing it, it doesn't matter what it's shot on or, or such, you know what I mean? Oh yeah. It's got to be, you know, of a professional looking standard in terms of that, you know, you could, it's literally, it's almost like, Almost how I'm set up would almost work. It's like a soft gray background and a mid shot or whatever and my performance is such. If I'm bringing an amazing performance that really draws you in as a viewer, they'll forgive it for being a self-tape. They just want to see how good your performance is, I think, really, isn't it? And can you, can you understand the emotional complexity of the character and what's going on in it? Absolutely. It's, yeah, exactly as you are there with the very plain background you know it's absolutely all that you need to establish you know maybe a tighter frame so it's not so wide side to side from your arms you know it's 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 absolutely okay but when you are in that frame it's so paired back that all we can really see is the words the character and the performance yes. you know so so it's a very it's a very kind of effective way. And like, even when I'm talking and I'm doing sessions with performers and they have no show reel and I'm like going, Hey dude, it's not okay in this day and age. Your spotlight profile is now, you know, you're just, you're just not optimizing it. It's like, 
you know, your, your spotlight profile can, it can speak because your showreel is there, your voice clip is there and casting directors will look at it. It's the yeah. first thing they do. And then a lot of time I'll spend weeks with performers going back and forth with them, getting them to understand how to edit the footage they have. Because, you know, you're kind of going, okay, so you're under time pressure, you're casting assistant, you need to find the butler. Okay, it's always the butler did it. So let's just use the butler. It's the butler. And, you know, then you open the footage of the guy who's great and he could be the butler or the girl who's great and she could be the butler or whatever. And the first scene is 20 seconds in the rain of a car that we can't see you because this was your first ad and this is you on a thing. And I'm going, they're gone. Yeah. They are gone. Next. They're not there. They, they're not going to watch it until it opens on you. I'm like, your showreel is your showreel. It should open on you. Very clear if you want to use a credit or else just black to open. Like, no madness going on of like, oh, well, like the, the scene started, you know, and then we have a 25 second establishing shot of some guy walking up to the door to knock and then you open. And I'm like, just open with you opening the door. Like, it's really weird how, how, how we don't, people are almost, they're, they're sort of, they're, it's funny, isn't it? Like people get quite strange about the footage they have. It's like, this was my moment. I did this professionally. I'm going to put the entire scene up. And I'm like, that is not how showreel works. Like the headshot, you have to go in, dissect your performance, cut everybody else out, and put you front and centre. And if you have a great little performance, and then you want to follow it with a really well-prepared and thought out and well-filmed self-tape showreel to, to show your range and to show what you're capable of, that's brilliant you got to be very clever about the edit. And I do spend a lot of time with people going, no, you shouldn't put up the entire short film where I'm going, oh, look at that other actress. She looks great. Yeah, I'm like, no. So in terms of duration, um, this is not for your family and your friends. This is not your own little mini film festival for you. I think anything beyond four minutes is pushing it. What do you think? I think, I think realistically, 20 minutes, tw sorry, 20 seconds, somebody's in or out. They're yeah. going to watch or they're not. So you've got to open it with a punch. It's got to be you, you, and, you. And it's you, your strongest work first, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, you got to just get it there. And then I would say, yeah, two and a half, three minutes. Plenty. Absolutely loads. I mean, they're going to make a decision after. They'll give it the first scene and then they'll give it the second scene. And unless you're showing them something in you, yeah. they're just like, okay, I, I, you know, it's kind of like, I think it's also important to remember the purpose of the showreel, which is more like, do I bring them in for an audition or not? It's not, you don't often get cast straight off just from your showreel, unless maybe it's something kind of like a short or low budget thing, potentially. And then you yeah. should have yeah. an audition. So it's, it's a kind of, it's, it's a more, it's a kind of a, a, a visual, digital, moving, talking, speaking, calling card, isn't it? Absolutely. And it's like people, casting directors are trained visually. And it's like if you go into a library, you know, the spine of the book is the headshot of you. That is your, the spine of you is your headshot. They take the book out, they turn it around and they read the blurb. And that is the showreel. If you can comparatively think about thousands of books in a library and why you want to read one. Okay. That is your opportunity. So everything jumps from there. And I think more and more um, people are really advised to have some sort of footage for their showreel. And if you don't have professionally shot footage that is well lit, that features you, then you are absolutely, totally encouraged to go and make a showreel for yourself. It's also, I think, like, uh, I think Carla has mentioned that I think she has some footage from a short film that she did where it's actually not the best. And I don't think it's necessarily her performance. It's just the actual, the, the short itself maybe didn't turn out to be as great as it, everyone hoped. That yeah. 
the, the balance of, well, I want to show I've done something professional, but does that risk uh, my chances of being called in? Whereas if I had to put some self tapes up that I know I'm much better at. Uh, yeah. My theory, Ali, is it not a case that they'll actually, they'll see on the CV that you've done those professional gigs. Yeah, and they, and that's the thing, you know, casting directors are very much trained to understand your CV. Like they read it the way we read our receipt in Tesco's. You know, they 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 kind of are trained. They're doing it hundreds and hundreds of times a day, and I think it's worth remembering. And um, there is some sort of an equation about you know Hollywood feature films about for every minute of film, I think it costs you know on average like eight hundred thousand dollars. You know, there's and you know to to achieve that look and short films they can be great learning curves. I would encourage everybody to do as much short film as you can. Um, but yes, it can be a diff disappointing journey because they don't have those budgets. A lot of people are learning on the fly. You know, the sound can be odd. There can be, you know, there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong. But I do think that you will get the opportunity and everything goes back to networking and relationships and you got to start meeting your, your community somewhere, you know, and short film is a really good way of meeting people that are, you know, throwing themselves in there. And you, you know, you kind of meet the same people in the business all the way up through the years, yeah. you know, so there's always a really good argument for doing short film. But again, it goes back to you being the editor and understanding what your biog and your profile on Spotlight mean. And the problem for, I think, actors is not understanding how they're being interpreted. It's almost like a little like Alice in Wonderland. You have to go through the mirror and look back at yourself and you have to understand how you're being perceived in a funny way professionally and who's looking back at you. And that, what they're seeing so it's not about putting everything open out there you have to become almost like self-editing you have to go okay that headshot isn't my best even though it's my favorite emotionally this short film that i loved and i was the lead isn't it didn't come out the way i want it so i can't have that but this where i wasn't the lead but my you know there's all these strange kind of choices and decisions that you have to really train your eye and your understanding to kind of be very strict with yourself. Right. Um, um, does having a good show will matter more to a casting director than if you have no real professional acting experience on your CV? Does having a good show will matter more? to cast and directors than if you have no real professional acting experience on your CV. I think they're going to be judged, yeah, on what they see in front of them, not because everyone's got to get a start somewhere. Yeah. I mean, there's so many people that are, you know, they're, they're notorious in the business for being the people who will field talent and they'll spot it and they're scouts, you know, and, you know, they, they will go, okay, you come in and do this, you know, so people are trained to see what you're doing. People are trained to interpret the performance that you do in any footage. Casting directors, all the assistants, the associates in the office, you know, if you send them footage, they will watch it. Yeah. You know, that's the bottom line. And, and they're trained to see if, you know, if the camera likes you and if there is that synergy and that spark, that's what they're hunting. Everybody's hunting that in a funny way. You know, they will, I don't know, they will always, they'll always take a punt and they'll always take a chance. And a lot of casting directors in their own kind of funny way are quite anti-establishment as well, you know, and they don't care if you don't, if you haven't been trained or you haven't done this, you don't have the credits, you know, if they can see it, then you know, they, they, they'll, they'll, they'll put you through your paces. They'll bring you in. They'll audition you. They'll, you know, they'll, they'll do that. It's not the bill. It's just an introduction. You know, it's a chance. And they also want to discover the, the latest new thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, 
yeah, it's it's all of that. You know, there there is a big thing about bringing <clears throat> bringing talent to 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 the market and finding young young new hot performers. Like, there's a lot of there's a lot of focus on that within. And, and for directors and for writers, like people want to find that young talent and work with us. Um, I just want to tie in two questions and one, I kind of think they're under the same thing. Uh, Sam is expressing concern about showing too much, uh, trying to show too much range, and maybe not his casting type on his, on his showreel. Um, and Amanda is, uh, has been advised to make a list of my five natural attributes that I may easily be cast for and try to capture those in my headshot. So I think there's two things there. It's about castability, knowing your type and wanting to show range. I don't think you show it should be showing range for the sake of it. Um, it's a case of, um, you often talk about the great, great advice about watching the Late Late Show and the commercial breaks. Does that ring any bells? Sorry, I don't know if that was just me, if it was breaking up. Yeah, I know you froze there for a little bit. We were talking about knowing your casting type and, and showing it on the showreel versus a bit of range. No, I think, I think always, always dream big. Yeah. You know, always dream big and always go outside of, you know, if you have, if you have been cast and if you have achieved that casting and you've done that sort of character you know i think i think a lot of people ultimately begin to understand as performers that it's about the writing and it's about the characters and i think getting into the habit of turning over different different characters and capturing them you know and it doesn't have to be a big bells and whistles thing you know i mean if you have the way the way you're set up shimmy there and the way you train people to camera you know if you're set up with a little self self tape studio set up at home it's very easy to start to drop new scenes you know you just get into the habit of doing it and to reviewing it so i think i think you know even even to the point of going right okay well maybe this is the showreel footage that i have on my profile because I know it's a sure bet for getting me into the room as the butler, but I'm going to really work on a few scenes as being the boss. And I'm going to, I'm going to like email those out. I'm going to send out those scenes or tack them on to the beginning or the end. Like you just got to constantly, I think, keep working it and adding to it and watching what other people are doing and how they use it. Um, a bit of a random question, but it's part of social media, I guess. Is, do you think LinkedIn is at all relevant in the industry? I don't, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people do use it. Um, I don't know. I mean, do performers use it? I don't know. I, I'm a, I, I, I've, I've always had these strange email requests to join it, but I never quite understood. Some, I think I must have set up a count and then I just never knew. Right. Other than joining Spotlight, what would you advise to do to be considered for film work? I think this ties in with how do you hear about the auditions and how do you get seen? How do you get in the room? And I think, again, it goes back to social media, following the casting directors through social media, because they often put jobs out, don't they? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And like, that's the thing, you know, that's the thing about Ireland is like, if you look at someone like Louise Kiley, that's based at Bow Street, if you look at her social media, like she has like 10, 20,000 people following her. It's insane. A lot of those are actors in Ireland. We have like 10, 12 agents in Ireland. So in Ireland, you know, like there aren't a lot of agents so a lot of actors here <clears throat> they have a different sort of version of the system that that exists in the UK where performers exist and work consistently without an agent yeah it's just every every place has their own way of doing things you know it's 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 sort of a 
you know, and, and most cities or towns or places you go to, they have their own way of casting. They have their own sort of community of how to network. It's just, it's individual to every country. Um, and in Ireland, we, we don't have, we don't have, like, I think in England, there's like 5,000, like, it's a crazy amount of number, you know, of agents, because that is the, that is the true line of the population. But in Ireland, you can drop some, somebody a DM, you can send them the direct message, you can send, you, you can drop them an email, you can invite them to you know, whatever, look at this, go to this show. It's a very sort of informal, different system. Yeah. And a lot of people get a lot of breaks that way, you know, and they get into, they, they, they get into castings by literally doing that, just knowing who they're targeting and being really, you know, on it, I suppose, and enthusiastic and professional in how they approach it but staying in touch so we're going to watch another video yeah this is i find this really interesting it's from um it's from backstage um about uh, to what extent casting directors really follow social media or not in case anyone thinks they don't i found this really useful as well Social media is so important. Um, I'm all over social media. I mean, I, I follow me on social media. I use it professionally and socially, and I think it is so important to write a to, to write a line of either keeping two very separate worlds, having a social world uh, that's personal and private, and having a professional world, but. I think what is important as an actor today is that you need to have an online presence because there are people out there that are so good at it and that are winning at having a social media presence and it makes them appear bigger and more involved than they actually are from the get-go. They create something out of nothing instantly. They make us pay attention. They do it in a great professional way. Uh, they aren't negative. It's amazing. I mean, I, I have, I'm friends with so many actors on social media and, and, and so many actors are friends with me on social media. and. It, it's amazing watching and reading the rants that I see people in this industry do about the industry, the actual internal self-hate that we have about our business. And I just want to remind you that you are friending and you are friending people that, that run this business. I mean, you know, I, my employers follow me on social media and I have to, you know, I, I'm constantly thinking about that. And it's amazing just reading the rants, you know, that I, that I specifically see, you know, actors do all the time about how unhappy they are about either themselves in this business or how unhappy they are about other people in this business. And it, it's, it's not an attractive thing. It's and, and it ultimately, you know, it doesn't make me want to hang out with you. Which at the end of the day is kind of, you know, we are all this this a room f filled of of artists that all just want to hang out with people that make us feel good about ourselves. So when we read this rant on Facebook about, you know, you seeing some actor, you know, that just went into the show and how disgusted you were by their performance, I mean. I just want to remind you that, that you're probably friends on Facebook with, with people in that show, and they're probably not pleased with reading it. So just you, you, need to, you need to always be thinking about that on social media, but you also really need a presence. You need to actually actively be having a, a professional presence on social media. So that means having a YouTube channel with actual videos that represent you and what your skill set is right now, not what your skill set was five years ago or 10 years ago. That's something that, you know, it's really interesting. I've now been in the city for about 10 years and there are some videos out there of actors that I was watching 10 years ago that still are the videos that come up when I Google them today. And that's not helpful because I promise you in the past 10 years that actor has changed types. And so you've got to go through every year or two and kind of look at, reassess, you know, how you're being actually, you know, displayed online and is it actually a valid and helpful and, and good representation of you. And if not, then you need to get rid of stuff um, because when I when an actor comes across my plate and I never heard of them, the first thing I do is Google them, for sure. I, I Google you, I go on Facebook and type in your name and see what I can learn about you from there. I look you up on Twitter, I look you up on Instagram. I use everything because I need to learn everything about you. So I, uh, I, I search all of those platforms and so you need to make sure that all those platforms are either airtight and I can see nothing, which is totally cool and I totally respect that, 
or if they are, if I am able to actually see the actual stuff that's on them, that it's stuff that you're proud of. Just, you need to be proud of because it is, again, you know, it is what sells you. I see you way more online than I ever see you on in person. So that online presence is so important in 2016. And the other thing, the other thing I think it's, it's crucial for people to remember is that a casting director is actually just like a HR person. They are hiring a cast for a company, be it for a film company, for a short film, for, you know, for the production period. So you're going into this sort of little sort of space as creative collaborators and people People want to, they know they're going to have to spend this very intense creative process in this time pressured sort of zo zone together with you. And they're going to want to spend time with you. They're good. They know they're on the bus once they're on. It's like, you know, for a lot of people, it can be four weeks of filming, eight weeks, six weeks. That's a lot of time to be around certain personalities all day, every day. So you don't want to be maybe, you know, like unpleasant online and then in the room, you know, like, you know, these things are intimate. Getting things across the line funded and produced is quite a process in itself. And they're fast moving, intense experiences and people want you on the bus or they don't. And if social media, if you're, you know, aggro or fighting on it, you don't stand, you know, it can, it can just blow back in your face really unnecessarily, you know? It's a, it's a very small industry here and word does get out. And, and as Sir Ronan said in her, uh, an interview we did with her a few weeks ago, nobody wants to work with an arsehole. Uh, so it's like be mindful of before you open your mouth that you put something out there that if your friend can see it, the industry can see it and it, and it yeah. doesn't get back. Yeah, absolutely. And then there's certain people, you know, in Ireland that have, you know, they are kind of edgy. Like I think Mark O'Halloran is great on Twitter. You know, that, that guy TKB has made a really strong sense of himself. Like, you know, you can really own it as well in a very but it's very clever, but you've got to be able to stand over it, you and know? I find that not everybody is like that, that has those really smart quips or really gets it. It's not for everybody. That's fine. And isn't it interesting that both of those are sort of like a bit more what Tara was talking about. Like they're like maker performers, like yes. they're writers and yes. they're performing. Like, yeah. you know, it's kind of interesting. And like the other person who is great on, on Twitter is that guy, Lenny Abrahamson. You yes. know, it's like, and strangely Joe Duffy, like there's really random people, like each platform throws up like some sort of, you know, the bizarrest creatures that it works for. Yeah. So you've got to be aware of, it, of that. And yeah, I just think, I think, uh, I think a lot of what Tara and Patrick, I think Patrick was probably erring on the side of caution about not wanting to frighten people. But, yeah. you know, if you have to put what he said, what Tara said and what that guy, I thought that was a really good video. You know, it, it's part of our world now. Yeah. You just have to include it and be really sensible and understand that older industry professionals are looking at your profiles that way. I think ultimately at the end of the day, we have to make sure that we don't become bogged down in this or fear it or dread it. It's just a, a part of the business. And I say, I, use, I don't use the word business lightly. It is a business, it's an industry. But ultimately as actors, the first focus has to be on, on the work you're doing as an actor. And the other stuff, you know, it should follow after that. Hopefully it'll take care of itself in some way. As long as, as you say, Ali, we just follow best practice. I mean, just, just think a little bit before we, before we do our interviews or promotions or anything else that we do. I want to thank you for your time, as always. Um, and thank you for the, uh, for the attendees for hanging in there. I think we only lost one or maybe four or five over the course of the session. Um, and I would ask you all maybe just to uh, keep in on our social media because we have a couple of more webinars coming up with some interesting people as well on finding an agent uh, and then our screen acting webinar as well. Okay. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you for, uh, for joining Wash us. Wash your hands. Wash your hands, Joe Duffy says. Yeah. <laughs> bye. 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 bye.
Bye.